his bachelor's degree in biomedical engineering and economics from Duke University and a master's of business administration from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. Please join me in welcoming Robert and Rustin Thank you. I should also add to, to my bio, I also know the least about blockchain on this <laughs> so we'll look at that way to start. Well, welcome to this uh, discussion. We're really excited, and we're, as I mentioned, we have a very distinguished panel here. Uh, we'll get to meet them here in a second, but just want to set a little bit of context for the discussion. Certainly, uh, blockchain has received a lot of press recently. Um, it's the you know underlying technology behind Bitcoin. Any, any Bitcoin investors? All right, all right, good. Um, so, you know, for those of you that don't know, everyone's heard of Bitcoin, right? It was trading at about six cents a coin back in 2010, it reached a peak of about $19,000 in 2017. So, if anyone raising their hand was in it back in 2010, you're alone. Um, but, you know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of questions around, well, how tangible can that type of success be and be replicated across other industries? Um, but the finance sector right now is really at the of that in terms of exploration and adoption of blockchain. Um, Accenture did some research recently where they said eight of the top 10 banks right now um, could reduce their financial infrastructure costs by about 30%. So that would equate to about $8 billion a year. All right, so right now Citibank, Goldman Sachs, and a number of the other top uh, global banks are um, employing or deploying blockchain solutions to really eliminate financial intermediaries and start to reduce uh, international transaction time from days down to minutes. So really the question I think that's of interest to all of us is, so where does healthcare fall uh, from an industry perspective? And, and I would tell you candidly, we're a little bit behind and we'll, we'll hear that from the panel, uh, but we're moving very quickly. You know, as I uh, have joined Cardinal and been talking with different health system leaders, uh, blockchain comes up quite a bit, but it's really interesting. It's, it's a uh, you know, a topic of curiosity, of exploration, but not a lot of tangible execution within healthcare right now at the health system level. So I think it's an important topic to have a baseline of understanding uh, for healthcare executives and it's certainly aspiring leaders as uh, I think comprise of the folks in this room. Uh, at, at Cardinal Health, you know, we're really committed to driving those behind the scenes operations to streamline that to enable best in class clinical outcomes. And frankly, we see blockchain as potentially a really great solution to help augment our ability to do that. So, so with that, we, um, we do have a great panel here. And uh, one topic on the goal of the panel, right? We're not gonna leave this room as experts in blockchain, um, you know, for all of us uh, that are not one of these three individuals, but really the goal is, you know, get an overview. So, you know, understand a little bit more, uh, what are the potential applications uh, both in other industries as well as in healthcare, and then what are some of the pitfalls to be aware of? So you guys can be equipped to be conversant on that. So, so with that, we'd like to introduce our panel. I've asked them to say a few words about themselves, and so if you don't mind, we can start with Paul. Oh, okay. Yep. Hey. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Chang, and I'm uh, the global leader for blockchain for two industry verticals. One is uh, distribution, which is uh, uh, CPG wholesale uh, and retail, and the other is on the industrial side. So auto manufacturers, airline manufacturers, heavy industrial equipment. I've been in this role for about uh, 22 months now, which is like an eternity in the blockchain world. Um, and uh, I, I was telling them I, I log about 150 to 200,000 miles a year. And that's only taking half of the requests that come my way. Um, so it's been a whirlwind 20 months. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is, um, you know, at, at IBM, we've actually been doing some tangible projects. So um, during the course of the session, hopefully I'll be able to share some of those so that um, not only do you understand blockchain, but hopefully you can explain it to your mother. <laughs> um, that's a tough one, yeah. Uh, uh, so my name is Tim Mackey. I'm an associate professor at UC San Diego. Uh, I'm also the Director of Healthcare Research and Policy at UC San Diego Extension, and uh, I'm also a, a member of IEEE, and we have, a code, uh, we have an industry connections working group where we're trying to bring together, together different disparate actors in the healthcare space to talk about standards around blockchain so that all of us kind of understand what a health blockchain could look like, and we understand it the same way you understand something like 4G or LTE, et cetera, to build standards around something so that... Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's something that people can kind of tangibly look at, just like some of the things that uh, Paul was talking about. Uh, and in the context of 
blockchain I've been involved for about four years. I was brought in for the one use case. I'm actually a public health researcher, and uh, that was to look at it uh, in the fight against uh, fake and counterfeit medicines. But now I've expanded into other use cases, and what I've learned from that process and through uh, doing a lot of talks and doing a lot of research in the space uh, is that the design elements of a blockchain are really important but they need to fit to the use case that you're looking at. So uh, we'll tease that out kind of in the rest of the session. Uh, we can talk about all types of um, use cases in healthcare. There's more than one, and the design principles of a blockchain um, kind of solution generally should map to that, and hopefully, you know, that will improve healthcare overall. Hi, um, my name is Dan Pollitt, and I'm a uh, director and principal architect for Cardinal Health, um, focusing on new technology. So I have uh, the privilege of being able to uh, talk to a lot of these guys from IBM and, and many people in the industry around what technologies are coming out and in, uh, as well as working with uh, uh, manufacturers, suppliers, um, and uh, um, others in the industry to find use cases for how we can put these together to find practical solutions to deliver higher quality of service. And um, one of the interesting things with blockchains is as I started talking, it's, it's not just uh, working with uh, the people that we currently support, it's co-opetition, it's working with our competitors to uh, improve either drug supply chain safety um, or look at uh, uh, how we cooperate uh, to, to solve uh, uh, lots of industry solutions. So that's one of the, the uh, new introductions, I guess, with uh, uh, the blockchain technology is uh, it opens up uh, new discussions on how to solve some of our larger pro problems across the industry. Excellent. Well, thanks for being here, guys. So, we have a few questions I'm going to walk through, but I just want to let you guys know we will leave time at the end, about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. So, certainly if something comes to mind, uh, take note of it and, and we'll, we'll get to it at the end. But I think it'd be good if we start just with the basics, right? What is blockchain? I'm assuming there's a varying level of understanding and um, you know, experience with blockchain among the group, the attendees. So maybe we can start with that. You know, help explain some of the basics. Um, how does it relate to Bitcoin, and, and really uh, walk through that? And I think all three of you have an interesting take and perspective on that. So we'll we'll start with you, Paul. So if I do my job right, I, I shouldn't have to mention Bitcoin to explain blockchain. So um, <laughs> so I like to use an analogy. So let's say in 1970s we go on vacation to Hawaii. How would we have shared that experience with our friends? Postcards. Yeah, postcards or you know, you <coughs> pictures, yeah. you come home, you develop, put it in mail. I mean, it's like a week or two later before your friends and family see those pictures, right? In 2000s, with the internet, email accounts, digital cameras, you know, you're taking pictures, attached to emails, and you can send them off quickly, right? So certainly faster, but the communication is still point to point, and it's one direction. But if we were to go on vacation today, what would our kids do? Instagram. And why is that better? Snapchat. Is that better? Is that better than <laughs> email? You went like this, which meant one to many. Yeah, I know that's what you're saying. What else? Why, why else is it better? Instantaneous, right? People can get alerts. Yeah, you could even stream it live. Perhaps the most important part about that, though, is the fact that you can have a multi-directional, real-time dialogue. So as you look at your business systems, what system do you have that allows you to have multi-directional, real-time dialogue with your ecosystem partner? Anyone use such a system? Wouldn't it be great if you had like a Facebook network of just your key partners that you could have this communication in real time and be able to have secure transmission of uh, data as well as transactions? So think of blockchain as this platform that allows you to have this multi-directional communication in a secure manner with all your ecosystem partners. And with that, I didn't say the word Bitcoin. And I'll <laughs> All right, uh, can you bring the slide up? So I'm going to get you a little bit more bored now because that was a good opening, but I'm gonna go a little academic and go with some definitions. So one of the major things I talk about first is blockchain is not Bitcoin. So Bitcoin just happens to be a cryptocurrency that 
um, essentially is enabled by blockchain. And one of the reasons why blockchain was developed is to address the issue of double spend with Bitcoin. So you don't want Bitcoin being spent more than once for each individual transaction. So for that purposes, we can drill into healthcare and figure out what a blockchain healthcare really is about. And these are the major principles. One, it's an immutable, immutable distributed ledger that ensures the resilience, provenance, traceability, and management of healthcare data. And when we talk about Bitcoin in a setting like this, we're not usually talking about a public blockchain, which is what Bitcoin is. We're talking about a private or enter enterprise-based blockchain, which is used more as a data architecture to enable other types of processes. So some of the things that we look at when we talk about design elements for a blockchain is the first question, is it a public or private blockchain, or is it some combination thereof? And we can get into that more when we talk about uh, the different use cases. Um, and also, these design uh, choices that you make, public or private, consensus mechanisms, etc., which we'll talk about more later, really need to map to your healthcare use case. And then there's other things that can layer on top of a blockchain, such as smart contracts, um, different types of applications, uh, either storing a lot of data on the chain or off the chain, permission structures, etc. But um, from a very basic standpoint, blockchain is an architecture, and then you can layer on top of it different uh, components that can enable processes. And then the fundamental principles of that architecture is it's distributed, meaning it's not in one place, it's immutable, and uh, it, in, it uh, enhances the provenance of the data that you're transacting. So I'm going to build off of uh, what Tim was saying, and everybody always asks me, uh, what is Bitcoin? Bitcoin uh, uses a blockchain technology to connect many different partners throughout the ecosystem of uh, how we distribute coins. Uh, when you own a, a Bitcoin, you actually keep it in your wallet. So you, everybody has this application, it's a wallet, I, you can look it up, I can sell a, a, or trade a Bitcoin to someone else, but you're interacting with the uh, wallet. Same thing when I, uh, I can go to an exchange, I can exchange it for uh, US currency or other currency, so there's exchanges and applications that people interact with. Um, points of sale, there, there's now uh, coming up where um, uh, many retailers are starting to accept Bitcoin. A lot of uh, uh, countries where uh, the currency is not as, uh, as stable can transact Bitcoin because it holds a, a value throughout the world that can be trusted. Um, and then there's miners that, uh, that ap apply some of the security. But what we're doing across this is we have applications that interact with this, this chain of transactions and everybody can see what's happening. When I trade a Bitcoin, I know that mine has been deducted, somebody else has picked up one, and we know definitively who's got it. It can't be double spent. Um, uh, and that's the, the trust that the blockchain's providing. Now then, if we go to business applications, and uh, we'll look at supply chain. Uh, same blockchain across the top. The only difference is the applications that we're interacting with it now is, we're, this is a, a manufacturers, they're still using um, SAP or their own systems to interact with it. Uh, warehouse distribution, it could be air, um, SAP, uh, warehouse management systems, the transportation systems links to it, and hospitals, Epic, or other systems will start tying into it. That way we can track the, the provenance of material across the ecosystem. So um, we have a shortage of sailing. Should, how long did it take us to realize that it, we didn't have the bags to, uh, to actually um, provide sailing to uh, patients? If we'd have known sooner, maybe we would have moved uh, uh, started rationing our saline, move people to uh, Gatorade or some other way to get uh, uh, hydrated, and then we can, uh, uh, but that transparency allows us to provide better quality of care across the continuum. And that's really what I, I, I want to say is as we look at blockchain, the uh, technology stays the same and you're going to interact with the systems that you do today. It's just going to be building higher levels of trust and transparency across the ecosystem. Excellent. Well, I'd like to push on that a little bit more and really talk about the applications. I think that's what's of most interest to the, the folks in the room. 
Um, you know, I think we can we can get to healthcare and we will in a second, but frankly, I'm gonna go off script here a little bit, but we were just having a, a huddle right before this and talking about some of the tangible implementations in other industries. Um, Paul, you mentioned, you know, traveling across the country with, with different clients. Is there an example that you would say really helps to illustrate the tangible nature of how this can be used and what problem it's trying to solve? Sure. So um, there, I, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. The first one is the Walmart example. And how many of you heard of the Walmart using blockchain for food safety? Well, you guys are really in the healthcare space. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Walmart um, and some of their large suppliers, so things like Nestle or Tyson Chicken, um, they are participating on a blockchain network to uh, digitize information and track the goods from their manufacturing into the Walmart store. So in the case of a recall, they can actually figure out who supplied what uh, batch of which products and be able to execute a recall. So typically, it would take about seven days for a very complex recall, and blockchain can do it in 2.2 seconds. The cool part is, the CEO of Walmart, when we demoed the system, he said, hmm, this is really cool, but we shouldn't hold it alone. Meaning he felt it was more important for the industry to adopt so that every consumer benefits from this. Because, I mean, frankly, food safety should not be a competitive advantage. That should be a given. When you go to a grocery store and you buy something, you have to know that this is safe to consume, right? So, so the, since then, he invited Kroger and a few other retailers to participate. So when Dan mentioned this whole cooperation thing, it's, it's happening right now with Walmart. They captured up to 177,000 transaction events on blockchain on live product. That's one. The second is McDonald's said, hey, you know, we're going to go fresh beef to compete with Five Guys and you know, all of these other companies. Um, but they recognize that frozen supply chain, where you have 70 days of shelf life, to go to fresh supply chain, which you have 14 days of shelf life, is completely different world. They, you know, the inventory management is different, the turns are different, the transportation mechanism is different. So they recognized they need help. And so the help they got in the form of blockchain, IoT, with both RFID and temperature sensors, and analytics. So it's the convergence of technology. And you know, we all like to talk about convergence of technology, but in the supply chain space, I have not personally seen anything that's as cool as this. And I'll be happy to share with all of you some of the dashboards and reports that we're generating so that McDonald's at the corporate level, the supplier, and the franchisee level have views into what's happening in terms of not just how many patties do they have, but what's the expiration date of those patties. So you can you know, maybe do the rotation slightly different. Or has there been a temperature excursion so so bad that you can't actually serve the hamburger? Right. So that's another example. That's great. I think I'm getting a Big Mac tonight. Um, <laughs> so so what about what about healthcare specifically? You know the Drug Supply Chain uh, Safety Act and, and some other opportunities. Um, Dan, maybe you can comment on that. Right. So DSC, uh, DFCSA, so Drug Supply Chain Safety Act, um, right for. Uh, blockchain and being able to track uh, 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 supplies across the continuum of the uh, uh, of the working with HDA and, uh, and they're adopting standards and so we're looking at the possibility of how do uh, manufacturer suppliers track uh, supplies across the supply chain. Uh, Estonia is one of the more advanced digital um, uh, healthcare uh, countries and they've applied a, a blockchain to track patients uh, uh, through the, the entire continuum of care. So um, just to echo what Paula was saying, blockchain is in production. Uh, it's running in some, of, uh, in some healthcare industries and um, we're looking for more use cases and partnerships to uh, make sure we have the right use cases and the right partners to uh, pull out uh, more value from uh, the use of this technology. <coughs> Make a quick comment. Um, so in healthcare, there's not much in production. Let's just put it that way. Uh, and the primary use cases we're seeing are emerging. So we've talked a lot about supply chain in the health sector, health commodities. Um, another area is, of course, the aggregation of EHRs, electronic health records. 
a space that's really robust and is growing really fast. I think it will be actually the first one that will go into production at some level, whether it be a private blockchain or a consortium blockchain, whatever, is in the clinical research space, clinical trial space. So there's really good reason to have a blockchain that has different design elements. So you could have a private blockchain that's really just about study protocol management, ensuring your, your um, basically your product dossier is supported with trustworthy data and that you're sharing data across these different CROs or different uh, study sites. And then you could have a public blockchain or a hybrid blockchain that really is about e-patient recruitment and also electronic informed consent uh, through smart contracts. So clinical research tends to be, or clinical trials tends to be the space that's maturing the fastest and has the best value add in these different components. But I, as Paul gets to do the exciting use cases, I get to do the boring use cases and Dan gets to do in, the, in between, some of the key use cases I like the best are the most boring ones. So medical credentialing. Um, the ability to essentially, uh, when a physician needs to be credentialed for hospital privileges, just to have that process be a little faster so you can build them out a little faster. Um, those type of things, uh, making sure that that's not a manual process, but actually having a credentialing system that's backed up by a uh, blockchain-based wallet that has all those credentials built within it so that hospitals can then trade on that information and get that uh, physician in faster. Very similar use case in the education space, higher education, uh, university education space, where every time an international student applies to UCSD, we have to check all their credentials. And we have to verify all those credentials from the originating site. So instead of doing that, we're developing ideas and actually looking at things to do from a pilot standpoint to build an education wallet where all those credentials would be in one place and then they could take that with them where they go. Uh, so, and then in, in a broader standpoint, I think the whole issue of liberalization of uh, consumer healthcare data is a big use case in um, blockchain and healthcare. And a lot of that is just about incentivizing patients to share their data to different people through the use of tokens. Uh, so the last thing I'll say is you do not need a token, you do not need a cryptocurrency for a blockchain. It's just one of the components you can add to enhance the effectiveness of whatever process or behavior you want in that environment. I was going to ask you a little bit more about that, Tim, in terms of patients and their ability to kind of move one, from one provider to another. Um, you know, thinking about visioning a little bit of an ideal state, what what do you see there as the potential and, and, and the path to get there? Yeah, so I think the vision is, well, there's, there's a lot of things. It depends on which stakeholder you are. If you're a consumer, uh, if you're a healthcare consumer, you want to have more access and control to your own data. So ideally that would be that you could get data from different disparate sources, either your EHR through, you know, um, through an API or some other electronic health record portal through FHIR, et cetera, and it could basically put that information in your wallet. You could get information from con more consumer health areas, like maybe you did a 23andMe test for your genomic data, you could pull that in, and you could essentially pull all these different forms of data sets, your Fitbit information, uh, health behavior information, uh, maybe even your claims data, and you would have a digital health identity. And then with that wallet, you could carry that with you, it would be portable, and you could share it and commoditize it the way you want. Now that's a big grand plan, but there's a lot of different providers. Their business case or their business model is predicated on the fact that they can commercialize that data and maybe make it a little bit harder to share. And then we have different health systems. I'm in UCSD, we're an Epic um, a system. So we tend to follow whatever Epic tells us to do, and if we don't have a blockchain module, or they're not standing up a blockchain module, then we'll probably wait for them to do something like that. So on the payer side or the provider side, there are different incentives um, for what a blockchain may look like. A lot of hospital systems are concerned about aggregation, so you can do more population health statistics and ana analytics. Um, some other providers are more interested in the clinical care component, and then some of it's more process driven. So from my standpoint, it's about liberalizing healthcare data, and a lot of that will uh, improve areas that are pain points for us, continuum of care. So if we can ha have better access to this data, when a patient switches providers, they can have a better continuum of care across provider networks. And uh, so, but we'll have to get to the issues of regulatory control, PHI, HIPAA, and also just the general sharing of data, interoperability standards, before we can get to that long-term vision. So one of the things, when you think about a wallet and what's in there, um, what this also allows you to do is establish trust. So how does the doctor know that the what's in there is accurate? And that's one of the things that uh, blockchain brings to the table is 
the ability to establish trust and you can uh, uh, validate the providence of uh, test results or anything that's in the wallet. And that's one of the, uh, that's one of the things that's been missing. If you keep your own personal records, I keep them uh, uh, in a folder or something. How do you know they're not forged? Or how do I ch uh, establish the providence of them? And uh, trust is a huge uh, uh, commodity that, that blockchain brings to the, uh, uh, to the table to solve these problems. What about the topic of adoption, right? With any disruptive uh, technology, that's often an overused term, but with disruptive technologies, there's an implication that we really need to disrupt our existing processes. Um, you know, from what I've heard, you know, uh, would love to know, do you think we need to disrupt processes or can it plug into and make more efficient existing processes, right? What, what are the steps to really start adopting this? Yeah, so again, I'll just share those uh, examples there. So um, for both uh, on the Walmart project as well as on the McDonald's project, um, the business process has been modified slightly, but there's really no impact to the legacy system. So what we're doing is we're essentially taking your core data set and doing an API integration to a blockchain. But the beauty is, once you've done that, you can now share that with everyone who, if you choose to, everyone who's on that network, versus having point-to-point -point API integration with everyone. So if you think about that, it's actually quite a bit more efficient, um, with uh, you know less uh, disruption to your existing business. Um, and th right now, this layer actually sits on top, right? So think of it as a system that's shared among multiple parties. And today, there isn't such a system, right? Um, socially, right, as consumers, we use Facebook because that's a network that we could all feed data into and share. We may have the original photo on our phone, but that's where we're sharing. So think of blockchain in a similar way. You have a common platform that you can share key bits of transaction data with your trading partners to come to a settlement quickly, right? So that's where um, business process could be also share, you may have a seven step receiving process and someone might have nine step receiving process. Well, you could agree on some business process that works for everyone and that actually streamlines the entire transaction uh, quite a bit. Okay. Um, Please go ahead. Just going to a room and you hear sharing data raises some red flags right away. So one of the things that's really important in blockchain design is how you structure your permissions and your governance. Because not all data has to be shared. In fact, very little data can be shared on the actual chain of uh, the blockchain itself. It could just be a validation that one trading partner actually did trade in the transaction or had a node connected to another. Um, so I think adoption is about understanding how blockchain as a technology fits into a particular use case and then getting around the issues that are specific to that vertical. So PHI, HIPAA, regulatory issues are very specific to healthcare. And a lot of people in my side, on the supply chain side, which we do a lot more work with, uh, in the same space as Dan, um, you know, trading partners in a supply chain are just oftentimes in the healthcare sector not going to have a conversation about sharing data. So a lot of times you have to identify what the pain points are that really inhibit blockchain adoption and get past that first. And a lot of times that starts with not talking about blockchain, talking about the process first or whatever use case you're looking to solve and then just saying, hey, we can back end in this to a solution like blockchain. So to me, that's, that's pretty important when we talk about adoptability because in the healthcare space, we are relatively slow in adoption. So, you know, it's interesting when you say uh, sharing data, we're all concerned about it. So when you go to, uh, uh, a restaurant, somebody says, prove to me you're 21. What, what, what are they looking for? Your license. Right, so what have you done when you've handed them your driver's license? They have your home address, they've got your driver's license, your birth date, your blood type. There's lots of information uh, that you just gave that person uh, when they asked, prove to me that you're 21. Blockchain will start allowing us to say, are you 21? And I can hand you a token that definitively would prove I'm 21 and answer the question that's being asked as opposed to I have to open up the entire dossier and hand you all the information. So those are some things that we started looking at is how do we answer the question that's being asked with the right information. So if I want to know you're 21, I want the answer, are you 21? I don't want all the other information that comes along with it. And those are some of the things that we can start building 
uh, trust in the ability to share data is answering the right questions. And as a, as a follow-up to that, right, in terms of the license example and not sharing other data, uh, we live in a HIPAA, HIPAA society, right, uh, or industry, and we hear about data breaches very often in other sectors. Um, how, how secure is blockchain and, you know, is it, is it hackable, so to speak? Can you educate us a little bit on that? So blockchain uses um, a lot of sophisticated cryptography to, uh, to protect the data. And to my knowledge, the blockchain network has not been hacked. It's those applications that I talked to you about that have been hacked or the social engineering to hand over your password. Um, recently I saw um, uh, someone sold some Bitcoin and a person paid with it with a credit card. The Bitcoin transaction went through immediately and the guy reversed the credit card transaction and he was out $120,000 on a couple of Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. So um, right now the, the blockchain itself hasn't been hacked. People are going after the applications and uh, the insecure uh, part, parts of the, uh, the network. From a HIPAA perspective, um, there, there are companies working on securing the data more. I think that's probably an area where uh, more work will be, will be coming out uh, with, the, with these new crypto algorithms. And um, say we're, I, think that's, uh, I think we're still early on uh, uh, people will actually definitive saying, I, I trust this for HIPAA. It, they'll trust the transactions, and then we provide the information and the pointers to it. But um, I, I think um, more work's going to be done, and it will change. This is uh, so disruptive. I think there's, the companies like IBM and others are going to uh, solve that problem. Yeah, and if I can just address it more practically here. So, you know, I, I don't like to use the word never, right? So we're not sure whether someone's smart enough to, you know, uh, crack our blockchain. But it does have uh, some inherent uh, capabilities that make it difficult. Um, and um, because there's you know, it's essentially multiple iterations of the same data, you may be successful in hacking one node. But as soon as you change one item on that one node, then everyone else would essentially see that something has been changed. Right? So, um, there are uh, sort of a, a systems and processes built into blockchain that make it difficult. And oftentimes the question I get is, hey, why can't I just use my supplier portal to do the same thing? Well, if you want to enact all of those protections, then essentially at the end of the day, what you have is the blockchain, right? And, and that's where we always end up is, yeah, but I'll make it secure. I'll have a fallback database and, you know, it will sit off-site and all of that. So you can do that, or you can just use an existing blockchain platform. What about um, competitive relationships in the industry right now, specific to healthcare? Um, Paul, you mentioned in some of the other uh, industries, um, you know, there's, there's more competition or even collaboration. But how do you see this impacting uh, competitive relationships and interoperability in, in healthcare? I'll get started, yeah. Um, we're part of a group called the Center for Supply Chain Studies who is looking at uh, different reference models for uh, DSCSA compliance, so the legislation that was talked about. The interesting thing about that legislation, real quickly, is it is a legislation that in, envisions a national track and trace system. So we currently do not track and trace our drugs from the point of manufacture to uh, dispensing. Um, and it was built in a way that it actually maps very well to blockchain even though it never had the intention of having blockchain as its technology framework. Um, so a lot of groups are now talking about how can we fit the blockchain solution into this policy framework. And the reality is, is that uh, uh, these different um, entities in the supply chain, so supply chain comprises many different stakeholders, the manufacturer, the wholesaler, the GPO, the dispenser, the provider, they all have very different interests. So what you try to do is you try to build a consortium-based model where all of these different actors come together uh, and they can talk about essentially what the whole ecosystem wants out of a blockchain for this particular use case. For example, pharmaceutical supply chain. But so far, at least in the, within this one use case, it's really hard to build consensus, and consensus is a key mechanism in blockchain, about what we want our blockchain to do. How much data do we want to share? Which processes do we want to prioritize first? And I think 
and Dan can touch upon this, is, is if we pr uh, propose it more as everyone in the consortium can adopt an architecture and then build an application layer on top of it for their particular use cases, then people might get involved. But I think it's difficult at this point because people have different visions of what blockchain should be, and even when they're in a consortium model, it is hard to get consensus. So with uh, co-optation, I, I I've been working with uh, several groups, several of our competitors. Um, we all share some things in common. Uh, just as Paul said, uh, food safety, we all want a, a safe su uh, food supply chain. It's the same thing in the drug uh, supply chain. We, we don't differentiate ourselves on uh, drug uh, safety, and we're better off to, co uh, to cooperate to improve the, uh, the safety of the supply chain. So my advice is find the things that are in common that you share, that you don't differentiate yourselves on, and um, build systems that um, share the, uh, that consensus or that, um, that commonality, and then you'll compete on top of that. You'll differentiate yourselves in your products and your services that you'll offer on top of that. How do you see that being impacted by federal and, and state uh, governance in terms of compliance? Uh, as well as regulatory issues. I'll, I'll quickly take the first step at it. So when we look at, um, um, we have uh, DEA saying, uh, I want to, uh, I want you guys to work together and uh, uh, improve the Drug Supply Chain Safety Act. Then I have antitrust, anti-collusion saying, I don't want you guys working together to collude to set prices. So we're caught in the middle between uh, trying to protect and uh, figure out what we have in common and then on the other side, uh, uh, even the impression of collusion, it doesn't have to be lawsuits, it's just the impression that you're working together to set prices or to do something uh, uh, nefarious in, in the system. So I'm hoping some of the, the, the laws will change to kind of enable this, this co-opetition so, uh, so that we can build solutions that are the right solutions for the society or the industry. Um, I would just say, from a policy standpoint, policy is relatively not flexible to new technology. So when you look at the FDA's uh, regulatory structure for mobile devices and digital health, we're still using a medical device framework. Um, and, you know, so essentially a lot of regulatory structures just aren't adaptive to technology, and especially this type of technology, which is kind of hard to explain even to a regulator. And there's not much out in production yet to really you know, test out a legislative framework. So if you're waiting for policy, I think you're in the wrong room. I mean, policy is not gonna help in this space. What I do think will help are states can innovate because they can innovate outside of the federal government. So there are states that are adopting more um, proactive uh, policy around cryptocurrencies, things like that. So, and then industries themselves can be innovative in their standard settings. So again, you do not have to wait for the U.S. government to decide what the standard is for a particular blockchain, you know, component. And they don't want to, you know, kind of op opinionate on that either. I can tell you that from my discussions with FDA. They would rather have consortiums, other industry-led groups, things like that, kind of explore standard settings, including IEEE, which is one of the things that we do in IEEE Standards Association. Uh, building, you know, connections with industry, deciding what the standards are, and the standards become not law in the context of legislation, but they become uh, kind of a, a standard setting process where people can understand that this is what is expected out of a blockchain. And so then, you know, actually legislation can adopt standards and then it becomes more binding law. So there's many ways, but if you're, again, the major takeaway here is if you're waiting for the policy environment to enable blockchain adoption, my personal opinion is you're going to be waiting a long time. But I'd be curious to hear what Paul has to say about well, and I think um, there are different approaches you can take, right? So if you look at the Walmart example, you can go to the FDA or the USDA and say, look, let's use this technology, we think it's going to work better. Or you can actually demonstrate a system that you deployed that made a recall in seven days versus 2.2 seconds, right? So as a, as a founder of this network, Walmart could say, look, I know a little bit about the technology. Here are the results. What do you think? Do you want the old traditional system where it's one up, one down, or do you want a network approach where you can do it in seconds? And I think some of the industry leaders, frankly, 
That's the position that they take it, right? So this is one area, you know, you talk about bleeding edge, leading edge, fast follower, all of that. If you're creating a network where multiple parties are going to be jumping on board to try to solve a problem, and if you're one of the early adopters, guess what? You set the standards. You use your business process and you map that to the network. Everyone else who's joining, guess what? They're going to have to adapt their business process to the business process that's on the network, which is yours. So yes, Walmart did a great thing by working on this you know, project with us, and they essentially donated um, to, the, to the industry. But the business process that, that's defined in that food recall network is based on Walmart's. Right. Well, one more question, and then I want to open it up to the group. Um, and it, it's one as we think about, you know, having been in this session, how do the folks in the room think about staying, you know, current with what's happening uh, in blockchain to educate their organizations and, and know when's the right time to really um, take action, right? Are there um, sources of information, are there actions that you recommend uh, for folks to stay up to speed uh, after this panel? Well, honestly, uh, in academia, we're way behind on blockchain research. A lot of the actual implementation and innovation is happening outside of academia, outside of research, and in industry. We just haven't been very adaptive to keeping up, and we don't have the resources compared to an IBM or even a Cardinal uh, or any type of company, essentially. Um, we're driven by grant money, so that's how we do <coughs> research. That said, um, I think that's part of the problem. Uh, because there's not much public information out there when it comes to actual adoption of blockchain technologies. Like, as a researcher, I, I often don't have many use cases I can point to that are in production. And I don't know, a lot of times a company will come up, come to a, a, you know, a talk and they will not be as forthcoming as Paul is about what they have in production and what they're working on even at a POC level. It would be very abstract. So I think uh, from a resource perspective, we have a lot to work on. Um, there's not much educational resources out there. A lot of it, I think, is skewed to cryptocurrencies and tokenization. A lot of the money going into um, blockchain is in more of the speculative market, as I would call it, the ICO market. So there is a need for education and training, but we're not meeting those needs. So for you guys, I think there are a lot of resources. Gartner has several reports uh, on blockchain if you're able to access that information source. There is a growing uh, amount of literature, and uh, a lot of these things that are actually coming into production do have some white papers and technical papers associated with them, but all, not all white papers are created the same, let's just put it that way. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge. I'm not sure exactly how to answer that question. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, there, there's a lot of information out there, and, and normally when I, you know, give that analogy, I actually... Um, request people just erase everything they read about blockchain, right? And give me 20 minutes to tr try to start over. Um, and it's because there are lots of uh, people with strong opinions about what blockchain is, right? But I think, you know, when you read some of these articles, you should give more credence to those papers that are written on facts, right? Someone did a project and here are the results versus what they think would happen if they were to do X, Y, Z, right? There's a ton of that. There's very few of, hey, I did this and this is the savings I got. I have more, but unfortunately I can't share those, right? Because these are companies that are investing, they're doing it, and they are using it for competitive advantage. Um, so my advice to the group would be, look, just dip your toes. Right, just just dip it in there and just try, even if it's something small. And you know, our slogan is "fail fast." Right? I mean, hopefully you pick the right use case and there's good business value. But it may not be. But as long as you find out within four weeks that hey, that doesn't work for us or work for my partner, so we're going to shut that down. Well, you wasted four weeks and you know whatever uh, money you invested. But that's how you that's how you learn. Right? You get personally vested. You learn from inside out instead of just reading articles. And I've read some of those articles, and I would completely disagree with over 50% of those articles. I'm not saying I know everything either, but 
I've experienced a lot of real life deployment and I've seen the numbers. Um, so there's lots of misinformation out there, not intentional. I mean, all goodwill, but uh, they just don't have tangible results that they can point to. Uh, whereas I've been fortunate enough uh, to be able to be involved in some of these projects where we've been able to measure the benefits. And for my advice for the group as far as, uh, and I've worked with IBM and, uh, and, and others, there's fundamental core concepts of blockchain. Understand those. Um, the technology can get very, very detailed and you'll get bogged down in uh, crypto algorithms and, and new coding standards. But when we talk about consensus, trust, uh, working across uh, uh, the industry, uh, that's where I think as, as uh, business leaders is think about how your industry flows and where the friction is at and could um, uh, building a bus across multiple disciplines actually uh, uh, achieve the results that you're looking for. Um, and then for, for, for geeks out there, there there's, I, I usually find and follow blogs of implementers of technology. There are a lot of partners of Paul's that are, that, and it's very open. The whole community is about um, sharing. So if you find somebody where it's, it's uh, hidden or it's not shared, that's, not, that's one of the concepts that blockchain doesn't really uh, support. It's, it's open trusted communications. So uh, looking for those and then uh, working with partners. Uh, and I've been out to uh, several of the hospitals. We're looking at, at uh, use cases and how we partner to uh, extend the supply chain or look at the problems that you're having from uh, talking to clinicians of how do you know you have the right stents in the cabinet at, at the moment or did you have to substitute and if you did did you let the doctor know beforehand so they're not surprised I think it's that that understanding and doing gimbal walks and, and knowing what uh, questions you're going to answer and can a blockchain and, and sharing uh, information across that continuum help solve the problem Excellent. great thanks guys well, I want to open it up to uh, to the group for questions so um, can you raise your hand and just, just speak uh, loudly and direct your question if you can? Mm -hmm. Yes, over here. But the security officer is really going to be that um, tension in the system you reference, saying this is not secure enough. We've already had attempts at hacking our healthcare data. How should I respond to that? Um, I, I'll take a stab at it. Um, sure. It's not a short answer. That's a really deep technical discussion that I can't have. Uh, someone on our team could certainly have with that person. Um, but just giving some examples that hopefully puts his mind at, at ease is the fact that, as you mentioned, these big financial institutions are putting their back-end financial data on blockchain and trading with each other. Do you think those big banks with their, I don't know, trillions in assets would be willing to put that kind of asset on a blockchain system if they didn't think it was secure? FDA is actually doing several pilots right now, one of which is your personal healthcare data. So you have your own personal, just as you mentioned, just a wallet with your personal healthcare data. You pick and choose who gets to see what bits and pieces of that data to external party. And they, it's a two-year project. It's not like they're testing it out for two months and then they're shutting it down. They know this is a, a long-term potential game changer, so they are testing this out. Um, you know, putting it through its ringers, if you will, in terms of looking for holes, looking for ways people can hack in. And so far, what I've heard is it's been, it's been successful. So, you know, we can have that technical discussion uh, with our PhDs, um, but, you know, he can also kind of look at the other industries that have adopted this and, and get a bit, bit more, you know, a comfortable feeling, warm and fuzzy, that this is more secure. And I think when we look at um, just some of the core characteristics of a blockchain or a distributed ledger, when we write to the ledger, 
it can't be changed. If there's somebody that tries to change it, there's other checks and balances that are in place to correct that. Um, consensus is another mechanism. So when we go to write something on the blockchain, do am I allowed to unilaterally put the information in or does everybody who have access, do they have to agree to allow it on? We don't do that today in our traditional systems. So there's a lot of security characteristics that are built into the blockchain system that um, that enhance the security. And as I, I work with uh, hospitals and we, we talk about uh, how do we know what's in a cabinet at this moment in time or who pulled it out and then we start marrying technologies. I have, Actually, facial recognition is, is fairly easy, so I can tell you who pulled something out of a cabinet and write it into the blockchain and say this is what happened at this moment in time. I don't know other technologies or other implementations that that's in place today to do that. So I would work through some of those core principles and, and talk through how blockchain is architected, and that's one of the things that Tim talked about is the core architecture of a blockchain and what it provides uh, to the ecosystem to not only provide transparency but to build the trust and it goes with trust is security. And I'll just follow up real quick. If you're, if you have a HIPAA compliant database, you do not need to put that information or PHI on a blockchain. So if it's a security issue that's associated with PHI, PHI does ne never has to go on chain. So that's one component. It's, a, it's, I think, a misunderstanding of what blockchain does. Blockchain can be a very heavy blockchain, which most blockchains aren't, which has a lot of transaction data on it. Most blockchains aren't going to be that. They're going to have pointers just to data. That data will still be secure, whether it's AWS, a HIPAA-compliant database, or whether it's some other data storage you use, or if it's on-site storage. It doesn't have to be a security issue. It can be more of a process issue. One of the things we're looking at at UCSD from a health system standpoint is just having different hospital systems. We have three large hospital systems in San Diego to share their EHR data at the aggregated level with the identification um, across three systems and have a machine learning algorithm essentially mine that data for certain quality characteristics we're looking for. And the only thing that we're doing is making sure that people understand where the data sets came from. The blockchain is just meant to establish provenance of the data of where it came from but it's never shared across any of those additional trading partners. So the machine learning algorithm is actually the only thing that's shared, the, the classifier, to get technical about it. So there's many use cases for blockchain. If, it's, if you're going to start with your compliance person or security person, you probably don't want to talk about putting PHI on a blockchain. And we didn't mention GDPR either, but that's out there as well. So I'll stop there. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, That's in the back of the blue shirt. Could, could you all address the governance issue and the business issue? As these things are built and grow, and you start putting multiple partners in there, what about the governance? That's a great question. Um, so one of the things is um, when we build blockchains, um, and Paul and I talked a little bit about some of his examples, is, um, and you heard him say they donated it back. So it's being ran by... Uh, people who are not participating in the blockchain is being governed by people who ensure that the safety, the transactions are in place uh, to, uh, to guard the data. Uh, the other thing is, is that I talked a little bit about consensus. So when we go to say who's accessing the data and, uh, and you can use that to govern the onboarding process of is the person coming on board and does the majority of the group agree that their purpose for coming on board is meets that or are they an advertisement or a marketing firm that's trying to mine the data so one of it is when you form the consortium what is its purpose and governing to ensure um, only the right purpose is being met and there's ways to do that that's from consensus building um, I'd say that's probably one of the strongest ones and then um, uh, is it monetized and we've had some I we've read some blockchain uh, uh, experiments, and we've had some that haven't worked well, and some of it is uh, the governance of who owns it, and, and, and uh, we had really hard times around that, or is it built as a, um, a platform that's got common interests and governed for everybody to equally access and, and use for the right purpose? And that's from, from a governance perspective, uh, 
I, I think that's the, the, the best purpose is use your consensus mechanisms to keep the uh, fit of and purpose of the blockchain that it was established for um, true, to, true to its origins. So for the Walmart project, it's actually rather straightforward. There are 10 founding members. They form the governance board and they make all the decision regarding that network. Now the data that's sitting on the blockchain is really still owned by the original contributor of that data, but the governing body are the 10 companies that form the initial network. They make the business rules, they make the procedural rules, um, and then IBM, we are just the administrator of the network. The governance board says, hey, we want to onboard these companies. IBM, go onboard, onboard those companies. And we want to change the smart contract to this, go change it. So we are sort of the hands and arms. We provide the platform. Um, but all the critical business decisions are being made by the founding 10 members. And Paul, one of the things I, I thought was interesting with yours is, can IBM actually see the data? Um, that's a good question. I don't know. We probably can. Um, we don't have a note. Right. We, we don't have a node, but we are an administrator. So the answer I don't know. Uh, whether they can mirror um, governance to consensus mechanisms. So a consensus mechanism called proof of stake could relate to you know what the ownership structure is of that consortium. So I think you know governance is very important, but it maps directly to design because not all um, blockchains are consortiums. and Unilever use SAP, and some other companies use Oracle. So what we've done is, as, as we looked at the network design, um, we looked for common elements. And one thing, there was actually a common element, and that, that was that everyone shared EDI data with each other. So we essentially tap into their EDI layer. Instead of sending an EDI batch, you're taking some of that data element and putting it onto the blockchain node. And the minute that you load it onto the node, all the other parties on the network who needs to see that will have instant visibility. So my analogy of sending an email to one person versus loading it on Facebook network and giving these seven people the permission to see that. That's what we're doing with the Walmart project and that's been a huge help because now you're essentially developing one connector, if you will, from the EDI layer into the blockchain layer. And my thoughts are on that question is uh, it's around uh, uh, the interface that you build. When you build the standard interface, people are going to have to adopt to it. Fortunately, uh, and, and in, uh, in a lot of cases, we have EDI to fall back on, but there's other cases where we have to agree upon a, an API and use uh, a lot of the tools to, to transform that into the uh, to the message standard that is being applied across the entire blockchain. And I'll just, you know, I think it's it's about standards. So one, Fire is a API, it's interoperable uh, for EHR. So that's one example of essentially the US government standing up a standard uh, and trying to get it uh, have to have higher adoption. Um, there's other third party data aggregators that can help with the interoperability standpoint. UCSD is a uh, pilot, uh, you know, study for or pilot site for the Apple Health Wallet as well. So you can load in your EHRs into the Apple kind of health. Um, I forget what this is. It's a health wallet or health app framework in there. So there may be third-party aggregators or standard-setting bodies that help with the interoperability component. But it's a great question because a lot of systems, a lot of health systems, are trading on either Epic or Cerner, and it may just be that these large enterprise-based systems just decide not to be interoperable around a common you know, blockchain framework. So I think, I think it's a very good question, and uh, I'm not exactly sure I'm at, we're at the point where we can really answer that question. So sorry, it's not, not a good answer, but that's my honest opinion. That's that was uh, absolutely outstanding, and I won't thank you for your time. Thank you for ACH and Cardinal and Health. Uh, allow me to use the analogy of uh, electronic health records decades ago. Physician practices were always viewed as the paper charts within an office. Today there is data uh, suggesting and literature suggesting that electronic health records is 
the number one and perhaps the only reason for physician burnout. That's increased a couple of hours. <laughs> charting at home. Charting at home. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. I hear that all the time at ECSD. Charting at home. I can start. Um, so there's no literature. There's none. Nothing in PubMed. Nothing in, uh, you know, maybe in the gray literature. There's some stuff. There's nothing qualitatively heavy, like uh, a key informant interview or a survey-based instrument that would ask about adoption. And usually it's not targeted towards physicians, it would be targeted towards the CTO of our UC of Health System. So he's pretty bullish on blockchain, but he's not pulling the trigger either because he's waiting for Epic to tell him what to do to a certain extent. Um, and it's hard to move these large enterprise systems. So we don't really, unfortunately, in this conversation thus far, we're not engaging the provider much. And I think that might be a good thing. Like, I think blockchain technology should be something relatively invisible to the provider. And I don't think we want to, in my opinion, add another layer of trustworthiness to a, a patient portal or an EHR system um, when a lot of the decision-making, clinical decision-making, is going towards automation, going towards a lot of classifiers, machine learning algorithms. I'm a big ML person, um, but I know that, uh, you know, if you train a machine learning algorithm on a particular data set that happens to have certain uh, features in it, then you're going to bias that classifier moving forward. So it creates some bias. You still need that clinical interpretation. So I don't think blockchain is a problem for any of that. I actually think the things that you're more concerned about are in the more machine learning space, the reinforcement learning space, and just our over-reliance on clinical decision making that's automated or structured. Um, I don't think blockchain should be seen by the physician. I think they should get the benefits but they shouldn't have to interact with it. My, my personal opinion, I don't know if anyone else. Well, and if I can just draw a little bit of analogy to, let's say, you know, farmers, right? So strawberry farmers today, they don't have an EDI system, right? So when they transact, they fill out a piece of paper, and then they, you know, send it along. And for every sale that they're making, they're essentially rewriting that information. So within the blockchain system that we've created for Walmart, we have a mobile app and they just enter the data. So we think there could be possibility to perhaps make it a little bit easier to digitize what you have. And I'm not saying, and I, I don't know what, what a doctor does every day, so um, I, I can't speak you know, in detail, but for farmers, we know we made it easier for them to digitize information and share that information in a real-time way with their key customer base. So in that sense, we've helped them. Uh, I think in the, the, the doctor's world, there's probably other you know, constraints that may, may make it a little bit more difficult. Uh, but the goal is really to use an app to digitize all data uh, the most efficient way possible. And then from my perspective, um, and Tim and I were talking over lunch uh, on some of the, the, the almost the identical topic of uh, uh, what do what do doctors or anyone do with all this massive amount of information coming in? And that's where like Watson or machine learning, you're going to have digital assistants that, that are going to help you make decisions. That's not necessarily blockchain. I think there's other technologies that are going to come in to uh, help us uh, as advisors. But blockchain is going to help you build more, uh, do I trust the information? Is it accurate? Can I track the providence of it? So you don't have to go back and, and doubt what's in the uh, what you're you're reviewing. I think there's other technologies that are going to come to bear to uh, 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 help uh, assist you. Yeah, I'll just say if you want to get to charting, maybe gamification of charting. <laughs> so then I just don't I don't see how we're going to charting is a really it's a huge problem in physician burnout right now. Uh, I I mean I'm not it's a bad answer to say try to make it fun and rewarding. But it's just, like, it's such a hard problem to overcome, so I really appreciate that. I think gamification could provide some benefit if you provided some economic incentive or maybe some buyout time. Maybe something like that, maybe recognizing that people are actually doing charting in the middle of the night. I have physician friends, they have, you know, toddlers like me. It's like they're completely burned out, and they're not being compensated for that time. So maybe a blockchain can help in a token that's associated with uh, charting. I don't know. Just a minute or two left, so we'll close out with the last question back there.
How many in the room here, your organization does um, digital advertising? So did you know that if you spend a dollar in digital ad, only 40 cents of that dollar makes it to the publisher? Why is that? Because there are middlemen who serve some function. I'm not going to say they don't serve any function. They serve some function, and they take a small fee. So your dollar spent is 40 cents. Now, what if you can put your brands with publishers on a blockchain network where you provide complete auditable history and traceability of that digital asset, digital data, right down to the publisher? Then could you eliminate a handful of these middlemen and have your dollar, 80 cents of that dollar, go to the publisher? So I don't know if this is revolutionary enough for you, but that is changing the game in the digital ad space. So when you talk about these ad tech companies that provide some service, they're scrambling to tr try to figure out how do they re-intermediate themselves into this new world where they could be completely cut out. You don't need them. Why do you need them when systematically you can say, here's my ad, this is who I want to target. Here's the uh, ad agency that, that provides the sort of the distribution and auditing, not necessary because you can just audit the blockchain system, right? So that is one where there's a company, they spend a billion dollars a year just on digital ad, a billion dollars. So if you think about it, he's mad that $600 million of it is not getting down to the publisher. So there's a, and again, unfortunately they have to remain nameless, um, but they are clearly looking to leverage this technology so that when they spend a dollar, they're getting eight days worth of ads versus four days worth of ads. So that's one, and I'll, I'll give you one more. Um, one company is looking at completely eliminating accounts payable. Why do you need accounts payable? when you can write some business rules that says, hey, if A and B and C events happen, then take X, Y, Z action. And if you digitize it in a trusted way, so this is where the trust comes from, right? You have to be able to trust that these things happen. So if you trust it and you see A and B and C occur, write the check automatically. Eliminate an entire accounts payable department. So that's sort of revolutionary. Um, I have a few more, but uh, maybe we can speak offline. <laughs> now, when we talk about uh, disruptive innovation and how do we adopt it, um, a lot of you guys must have been listening to Tim and I's lunch conversation because we had this exact conversation of, you know, uh, how do we how do we change the way a society or the way an industry works? There are tons of barriers from uh, people who are going to be disintermediated that are going to legislate it and, and sue to keep you from changing. There's standards, there's, uh, there's tons of barriers to the implementation. And one of the things we were talking about is, let's first understand the principles of a blockchain and then could you model that out in a sandbox and say, this is what the ideal world would look like and bring in just a different way of thinking. Once you understand what the art of possible is, then we've got to come back to the realist, you know, how do we build a roadmap to achieve that? And that's where we have to start dealing with the realities of uh, all of these impediments to the implementations, and it's choosing the right roadmaps and how do you do it. So do I start on, as you said, uh, Walmart started out as an internal project. They didn't go out and bring in everybody at one time. So how do we start uh, chipping away at what the ideal state might look like? So that's, uh, I, I don't know if that answers your question uh, completely, but uh, it's, it's about how we start. And uh, when you look at it, there are tons of articles about how disruptive and transformational it can be. And, um, and right behind it, there's probably a lot of articles that says this is why it can't be done. And we have to figure out where to start to make that happen. So I think I can finally top these guys because I've been pretty boring so far. <laughs> um, I had the epiphany of what blockchain could do 
on the air train from Jamaica Station. And that was all around digital identity. So if you can establish a health wallet that has all of your health identity from the beginning of your birth all the way to the end of your life, and that data can inform things like all of us, everyone know what all of us is? Persistent Medicine Initiative by NIH, where they're collecting large scale uh, amounts of data. Uh, it's uh, you know blood data, uh, biological samples, it's wearable data, it's genomic data. And you put all that into one identity and you can use that for um, pharmacogenomics, you can use it for drug targeting, for other precision medicine initiatives. I mean, that would really revolutionize healthcare as we see it. It would be really truly precision and individualized healthcare. And you could get to a more value based healthcare system, I think, if you had that amount of data at the individual patient level. Now, do you need other types of technology to mine that data and to assess what the best clinical treatment or outcome should be? Yeah, you need the machine learning that goes with it. Blockchain can enable that. Same with other technology. We're talking about a whole revolution in technology. 5G can revolutionize that by giving more data connections and better latency, uh, lower latency to those data connections, sharing more data that way as well. And then, you know, I'm a global health professor actually, so the thing that's getting me really excited in blockchain is like digital identity for refugees, for Syrian refugees, where you can use a blockchain and when they cross across different jurisdictions, they don't lose their citizenship. They're not internally displaced in their own country. And when they go to another country, they can access public services because they have the identity they need. We have the same problem even cross-border when it comes to people coming here with educational credentialing. Um, and then uh, one last one. I'm also, I have some legal training, so um, the legal field is really excited about blockchain. They are thinking about blockchain completely eliminating most alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. So med med uh, mediation, uh, arbitration, essentially this would be done through a consortium-based system and a governance system that you could uh, govern by smart contracts. And also, if you had a smart contract that self-executed on maybe a data point that said, well, the product was delivered, then the payment was made, and um, you know we have proof of that, and it's in a trustworthy framework, you wouldn't need to litigate whether that payment was made or not. It would all be executed by a smart contract, and there would be proof and conditions of why that would be met. So that, to me, on the legal side, is actually very revolutionary as well. Seeing a bigger push for lawyers who are just coders. They're, they're coding lawyers, and that's what they do. And, and so there's a lot of opportunity for revolution, but I think we're very early days. And so, But that's what gets a lot of us excited about blockchain. It's not just the small use cases but it's the big, broader things that we can do to transform society. Thanks, guys. Well, that's exciting to think about. I think Tim just teed up our next three panel topics on this, on this, uh, <laughs> on this topic. Of so, uh, well, we, we've just scratched the surface, but we have to end it here. I want to first say thank you, Paul, Tim, Dan. Uh, just amazing. A round of applause. Thank you. A really valuable discussion. Hopefully, all of you took away something that's practical, insightful, uh, so you can be conversant on this uh, with whatever your goals are.